Uh, hello and welcome to another Retro Power and Cut, episode 85 I believe. Uh, I'm going to start with Vader. So this came back to us uh, because the clutch slave failed. It's a, a concentric clutch. Now actually subsequently, probably to last week's video, I've spoken to two separate people who have exactly the same failure. Um, so it's worth me mentioning that the slave that was on it was what's often described as a Titan um, concentric clutch slave, but I suspect it, it wasn't made by Titan. Um, there are a slave available, there's a slave available that looks exactly like the Titan one. It's available from the likes of Burton, Motorsport Tools, Rally Design, all the usual suspects. Um, but I strongly suspect it's, a, it's essentially a, a replica one. Um, and certainly the seal doesn't seem to have been of the, a suitable, made from a suitable material. Uh, anyway, we've replaced it with the AP one and the transformation, apart from the fact it's now working, it's actually completely transformed the feel of the clutch. Uh, I suspect the cylinder size is a bit different, so it's a lighter clutch. It just seems way more progressive. I think the other one was sticking, so you'd kind of come smoothly off the clutch and it'd kind of jerk its way out. Which it wasn't immediately obvious that's what was happening, it just felt quite motorsporty. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's almost like just a normal road clutch now. It's got the AP slave on, so very happy with uh, the outcome of that. Um, everything else is fine on this. Um, that's going to be going back to the owner tomorrow, hopefully. So hopefully we don't see it back <laughs> too, too soon. Well, much though I love the car, I would like it if it lasted a bit longer without a fault this time. Uh, I'll mention briefly the Camaro, uh, and that will go into more detail. We're, this was sort of sidelined a little while ago. Um, at the owner's request, uh, we're kind of midway through the bodywork stage on it. We're just about to get back on with that, but we were battling with some metalwork on the wings. Um, so Nat will probably go into that in more detail on his part. Um, worth me mentioning actually that it's another week, because of the bank holiday, it's another week where it's only been, I think, three working days since the last video. So if it looks like we haven't done much, this that's because we have only been working sort of two and a half days. Um, Utah, I've been out in this, uh, did a pretty decent test drive the other day. Uh, I don't think I've got any footage of it, but I've done probably 30, 40 miles the other day. Generally good, um, but we ran into this, the problem previously that we had with the clutch. It seems to be a problem with clutches at the moment, um, which we narrowed down to being the master cylinder and replaced the master cylinder. The problem came back, exactly the same problem. Um, and the problem was essentially that the fluid wasn't being allowed to pass back to the master cylinder when you release the pedal. Um, and we stripped it apart again and realised that the one thing we'd changed over was the push rod because we'd modified the push rod uh, to work with the pedal that we've got. Um, and actually, the cylinder, the master cylinder we originally had had one type of push rod on it, and the spacing at the top was completely wrong. So it was not allowing the uh, piston to retract all the way, which is actually what I th originally thought was the cause, but I did some measurements and tests and it appeared that that measurement was correct, but the drilling from the reservoir to the cylinder was blocked. Um, with hindsight, it appears I was wrong the first time um, because we tried swapping the um, push rod, the, the new push rod arrangement into the uh, new cylinder and actually it worked fine after that. So it was essentially, the push rod that came with the first master cylinder, and this is another, another note for those buying uh, Mark II Jag master cylinders, it had like a neck down bit and a sort of spacer washer with a slot in the side of it that you could slot on from the side. And the spacing on those cylinders is completely wrong. It doesn't allow the piston to go far and back to allow the fluid back into the master cylinder when you release it. Um, and whereas the new one looks much nicer, it had like a captive machined washer on it with a really nice machined ball socket on it and the, sh the sort of shaft of the push rod was machined as well. Whereas the other one kind of just looked like a, it wasn't a casting, but it, it didn't have like nice machining marks on it. And the washer just looked like a, like a stamped out pressing with a sort of vague semblance of a ball socket on it. Um, so yeah, got to the bottom of that. That's now working second time around. Um, so I'm going to get some more miles on that again now. Uh, now we've got on that. And this is basically the, the process you get to at this stage with the car is finding a problem, resolving it, going out, getting some more miles on it and seeing what other problems you find. Uh, so that's that. Uh, walking past this has reminded me 
Land Cruiser stuff, I think we showed last week already the powder coat had come back. Um, if not, then, then either way, at the end of last week, the powder, powder coated parts all came back. And then today, all the Xylan coated parts have come back. So we've now got everything to rebuild the axle. Um, James has been stripping the powder coated axle casings back down, in, as in taking all the masking off them, where we'd got wooden boards bolted to them, etc., to bung up all of the machine faces. All of that's been removed um, and they're essentially ready for rebuild now. And now the Xylan parts are back, which is all of the fasteners for these. Uh, we're in a, in a good position to start rebuilding everything. So it'd be nice to see all that coming together. Uh, on the subject of the Land Cruiser, uh, Adam's been making some more progress on the engine. Um, we're just waiting for the block and heads back from machining. Um, but in the meantime, he's been getting some of the other components ready. And it brings me on to something that's worth mentioning. I mean, those who know Toyota from the 90s, they were making pretty much some of the best engines in the world at that point. Um, and the one used ZV8 really, you can tell looking at the engine that Toyota gave them a massive budget to develop you know, an absolutely awesome V8. Uh, and one of the details that absolutely marvels me is the gears in between the cams. Um, so the, it's got belt drive up to one cam on each bank and then there's a, car, uh, a gear in the centre of the cam that drive, transmits the drive from one cam to the other. Now, one of the things that would be potentially problematic in that is that any backlash between those gears as the cameras rotate will mean that gear rattles slightly back and forward on the teeth. Um, and Toyota's solution to that is that one of the gears on one of the cams is actually split like across the cross section of the gear um, and one half of it is floating and sprung slightly uh, away to a slightly different position from the, the other half of the gear. And it means that when the two gears mesh, it takes any backlash out with like a sprung segment of gear. Really amazing bit of design and just the sort of level of engineering you just don't tend to see on uh, many engines. So really, really um, impressive engine. And Adam was just re re rebuilding those with new springs in the, uh, in the, in the cam gear. Uh, so we're just yeah in progress with that engine. Block and heads back next and then we can do the, the bulk of the rebuild. Uh, Morris, last week, this was, I think, about to go next door, possibly, um, to do the flat and polish on the paintwork. Um, we'd wanted to get it mechanically built up to a certain point, but we couldn't go any further than, we didn't want to bolt any parts on the outside of it, obviously, until we'd done the flatting and polishing on the paint. So that's essentially where we take the from the gun finish and transform it to being a kind of finished car finish uh, to the level we want. Um, so from the gun, although Gaz is extremely capable at painting and his from the gun finishes are pretty much, I'd say, at the higher end of OEM car finishes, uh, there's still a level of orange peel and we want to get rid of that completely. So they basically start by wet sanding it all with 2000, uh, 1500 grit, 2000 grit, and that takes out any of that orange peel and gets it completely flat. Uh, and then they use a uh, Ferrecla G360 cutting compound, which is basically an abrasive paste on a foam pad in a Ferrecla polishing machine. Uh, and that just kind of machine polishes that flat, dull sanded finish you get from sanding it with 2000 grit and glosses the surface back up. Um, and that, yeah, that's it. There's no, there's no real magic to it. It's just putting the hours in. They've used uh, generally um, rubber, just small rubber flexible pads with the 2000 and 1500 grit on them. For some of the big areas, they go with Jura blocks. Um, but yeah, essentially it's block sanding it all with progressively finer grades of uh, abrasive paper and then polishing it up to a good finish with an abrasive uh, paste. Um, so that's done. Uh, they've done the bonnet and boot as well. We're just waiting until we're at a point we can fit those. Um, Max is currently working on the wiring loom for this. Uh, so yeah, it's all coming together. We were doing a bit of a planning session earlier on what the next stages are. I think we're gonna move forward with some of the coolant plumbing on it, start finalizing the radiator design. Um, Dean's been working on the seats. So I think next week we'll be able to show you the seats. I thought we might have them this week, but they haven't arrived yet. Um, so that's that. Uh, and E-Type in the background over there. Um, George has been working on more of the exterior design work on the E-Type. So I think I was struggling to remember where I got to last week. I should have watched the video to refresh my memory, but I didn't. Um, so the rear end, I don't think we'd, sorry, the rear end we'd done a lot of work on. I don't think we'd started much on the front end. 
Um, but that's what we've been concentrating over the course of the last week is, is changing the details of the shape on the front to get it to the point that we and the owner want it to be. Um, biggest part of it is the flare, which is one of the bigger changes on the Series 3, is that the arch was much higher up the body. And because the arch was much higher up the body, it necessitates having quite a pronounced flare above the arch. Um, and as you sort of play with the design in 3D CAD, you realise why that is. Um, and it's essentially, if you look at the side profile of the car, it's quite a curved out shape like this. And if the arch, top of the arch cut out and gets above the apex of that curve, it starts to cut into the body line when you view it from above. Um, so you, the only way you can get around that is by building a little peak that kind of uh, brings the wing out to stop that happening. So um, we didn't really want a massive flare there because that's one of the things that we're not too keen on on the Series 3. If you look at it straight from the front, that sort of point out at the top of the flare looks really quite bizarre. If you have a Google for some straight on, front on pictures of the Series 3, it's like, it's, it's almost point straight out as if somebody's grabbed, pinched the side of the wing and pulled it out like this. Um, but we still wanted a little semblance of a flare there rather than trying to make it look too much like a Series 1. Um, so we've dropped the arch line down slightly. Uh, we've inflated the overall shape of the wing, which helps flatten out the side profile where the arch is, which means you don't have to create such a big flare on it. So we've dropped the arch down, inflated the top of the wing slightly, uh, and then just given it a very, very slight flare on the top. Um, tweaked the overall shape of the arch. So I think we're happy. It was quite a few revisions of changes to get to that stage. Um, and then we're gonna start working on the very front next. So the grill aperture and the headlight design. Um, we're, we're pretty much at the point where I think we're all happy with the body shape all around. The changes to the rear um, wings, front, uh, front wings, and the valance, which is the primary bits we've altered on it. Um, so we're gonna start the component design now in a bit more detail. We've already roughed out the rear bumper, but we can start doing that in detail. And we'll start working on the front bumper design, the grill design, and the headlight design next. So very, very excited to see all that to take shape. Uh, I think on that note, uh, I'm going to hand over to Nat to show you what's been going on in the metal workshop. Uh, so till next week, uh, I'll see you then. Hello again folks and welcome to the uh, Retro Power Uncut from the fabrication side of things. Uh, well, fabrication and body shop side of things. And thanks to Cal for uh, handing over. And uh, you join me to begin with at Project One, the Mark One Escort some more progress this week. Uh, I'm leaning on a, a key visual bit, um, which is the upper bulkhead area. Uh, we have done a little bit of work on that. We did the same modification previously on another Mark 1 Escort that we built, which was to alter the, th this is a notorious rot area on a Mark 1 Escort. The, you, basically, you can't, a, a, as Ford constructed the car, it's impossible to paint properly inside this heater bowl, as uh, it would be referred. It, this is the area where, the, for those not familiar with the car, this is the area where the um, heater unit inside the car draws, draws its uh, fresh air from. The grill at the bottom of the windscreen there is the air intake. There's a rain shield inside and there's a standpipe attached to the inside, the, this scuttle part of the bulkhead inside here, there's a standpipe uh, attached to that, um, which is uh, seamed onto the inside of that, about loosely sort of 175 mil, 180 mil diameter. Uh, and that comes up inside this rain shield in here and basically makes a, a labyrinth so that water coming into this area can't be inhaled by the heater and then it builds up and it runs out of the drain at the, this drain hole at the bottom which normally has a rubber thing on it um, the problem with that design is as from as it comes from Ford is you can't paint in there properly you basically you can spray a bit of paint in there and you can spray a little bit up through the hole from inside the body shell you can't really paint most of this which is why this lower part rots away on all of these and and this on this car it was no exception this had rotted the inner tube section was like a doily and the rain shield was like a doily it was all all, all knackered basically <laughs> putting it bluntly so what we do for two reasons is modify the the scuttle top inside here we cut a much larger hole in that and then the cnc plasma a, a little frame section out and a blanking plate which i will run and get if jamie stays there i'll get the blanking plate because it will aid my explanation basically we make a plate like that which goes that way up 
on the underside of this panel inside the car and is retained by thre that many threaded inserts, I'm not going to count it, M5 threaded inserts on the underside of this, which also go through into this frame section that's spot welded inside there. Uh, and that gives us much bigger, that gives us a hole nearly that big to access the inside of this through. And then we can coat all of that with epoxy inside and coat all that with uh, wrap to the truck bed liner that we use inside there and also zinc metal spray inside it prior to that. So it means we can make that area much more rot resistant than it was originally. And all, that's a blank plate at the moment, but what we will do is then put our air intake somewhere on here to suit our HVAC unit that will be going in this car. Uh, and it gives us a bit of flexibility in that we can move that intake slightly. As long as it's underneath the rain shield, we can move that intake slightly and we'll then weld on a, a standpipe onto that which stops the water running in. Uh, and it means that we can position that exactly where we need and, it, and we can get in there to recoat it. So that's the modification done to the scuttle top. Uh, once that was all done, all spot welded in place, then uh, cleaned up, uh, put some uh, weld through primer on that just, just to get the areas, if, if there's any areas that get missed further down the line then they're covered. Shouldn't be though. Uh, and then we prep, or I prep the edges of this uh, heater bowl section, cleaned all that off, weld through primer on that, that's all spot welded on. In parallel with, well just prior to doing all that, did some further alignment checks on the windscreen aperture found a couple of small anomalies uh, in, the, in the structure of the car, uh, basically as it came here, as, as we um, picked the car up, there was a little bit of asymmetry in the, in the roof structure, it was slightly across to one side, so we've just edited that back slightly, pull, pulled that very slightly across to get that correct. And then the scuttle was um, Cleco pinned in place, well, no, Cleco pinned as I was corrected uh, the other day. <laughs> it was uh, temporarily panel pinned in place uh, to do a final check with the screen jig and actually also do a quick check with an actual with the actual windscreen from the car to make sure that the fit was decent between the pillars and the scuttle and that there was no asymmetry there which there isn't um, that was panel pinned in place final check on everything then that was deep panel pinned removed all the edges cleaned up uh, so there's no dirt or mess or burrs or any, anything else on the edges then well through primer applied to all the edges and that's all spot welded in place that's now permanent fixture, all in place and done. So the next step is to move back on to what I was doing a little bit earlier in the week. So now stepping back to where I'm standing, the wing and door, both sides, which have needed vast amounts of work and still need quite a lot more work. Um, but I wanted to get the scuttle fixed before I did any more on that because I need to do some more adjustments on the door hinges. And in order to adjust the door hinges, um, I needed the pillars to be more rigid, basically the pillars not to move while I was altering the door hinges. As it was without the scuttle top on, that area is a bit too flexible to make any precise adjustments. So now that's fixed, I can do that. With the wings on both sides, um, the other side, I haven't started the uh, off side yet. On the near side, it quickly became evident, well, fairly quickly became evident that I was going to have to remove the rear reinforcer from the wing completely, remove the upper reinforcer that comes around the end of the scuttle completely, reshape those, modify them quite heavily, and then refit them uh, because the wings are completely the wrong shape uh, at the back edge and along the scuttle edge. Completely the wrong shape. So I've now re. re completely reshaped those sections for the near side, loosely fitted them to the wing, and now the wing does match the profile of the door. The swage lines are a little off, but close enough, I think, with a little bit of tweaking, we can juggle everything and get that pretty good. Um, so now we're in that position there, I can do some, final, more, some further work in terms of refining the door fit, and then this side is getting somewhere near. Still got some work to do around the fit on the end of the scuttle. And then I need to check the fit to the front panel. That all looks pretty reasonable at the front. That's not, that's not too far off. Then I need to do all the same work that side. The door fits a lot better that side. The hinges were close to correct on the door that side, close enough that you know, it, it, but we would say they were correct. Um, and there's a bit of juggling to do, but I would, I would have expected to do minor juggling, just not nine millimeters like it was this side. Uh, and then on the front wing, I've got to remove the rear reinforcer, remove the top reinforcer, reshape them again completely so that the wing sits in the correct position. Uh, and then go through all that rigmarole of refitting the wing, refitting the reinforcers, making sure everything lines up, and then getting the all gap to the door correctly, which will be a lot of tapping and filing of the back edges, getting everything lined up there correctly. So 
most of that's going to be next week's work, but, the, but but we've done some at the beginning of this week in terms of in terms of alignment there, and then also on the doors. Uh, at the big, very beginning of this week, and it just into the tail end of last week, um, remembering we, we've, we've, we've just gone through a, a long weekend, um, the, Tom was working on the door latch mechanisms, modifying the doors. Now, that was something we did know we had to do. Uh, we wanted to use doors with the late, the, sorry, the early type outer skin, uh, but we wanted to use the late type latches. For various reasons, I'm not going to go into all the details, <laughs> but we wanted to use the late type latches and the early type door skins. So we have early type doors, but we need to modify the rear edge of the, the rear face, the latch face of the early type door to take the late type latch, uh, which we've now done. Tom's made a profile that picks up off all the key datum points on the back face of the door, uh, then welded up the original um, section in the back of the door, put the profile in place, cut the holes into the back of the door, swaged the account some screw holes, um, basically made a replica of the late type um, catch plate into the early type door. That's actually a pretty was a pretty straightforward job. He got through that pretty quickly. So that that phase is done. So now we're into, as I say, body the uh, door and wing fit up um, is the the next the next stint on this. Once we're happy with that and that that's all pretty good, I I, I don't want to put the, the the explanation of why I've not got the roof on yet is there will be some tweaking, I think, on the outer faces of the A pillars and along the top of the doors to get the shuts nice round there. Once I've got the gutters on, I can't do any adjustments there. And so I don't want to put the gutters and the roof on until I'm happy with the door fits. So that's the, the reasoning for the order there. That brings in a slight complication which really eagle-eyed viewers might have spotted, which is that if you don't put the gutters on to the body sides before you fit the body side outers to the inner, you can't get at the gutters to spot weld them. I can't get at the gutters to spot weld them. They're going to be plug welded on. I have no choice in that, <clears throat> in that they, they can't be spot welded. Um, but I can't see... Short of having Ford's production jigs, I can't see how it would be possible um, to do that at all because you really need the body sides assembled in order to determine the exact fit of the roof and you need to verify that fit before you fix the gutters in place. So it's a bit of a chain of events there and the, so the, 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 the answer is they have to be plug welded on afterwards to, to my mind, otherwise something's not gonna fit properly. That's, that's where we are on, on Mark 1 Escort. Uh, moving on, I'm going to swing by here actually, just to confuse Jamie because I haven't really gone through an order. <laughs> a Camaro Wing, 1968 Camaro Wing. Uh, long term viewers will remember the 68 Camaro, it's been in and out of work a couple of times. Um, following a bit of a pause, we're back to do some more work on it. The front wings on the car have been a nightmare from the start. We modified them quite heavily uh, on, on their mounting edge and a couple of other places around the front um, because of the sheet metal modifications around the front of the car. We n didn't make any alterations to the back area, to the back edge of the wing. No, no changes were made at all to that. And the problem we've had is that really these wings have been no good from the start. We should really have made an executive decision to change them at the beginning. The problem being that we weren't convinced we would necessarily, they're aftermarket wings, uh, um, USA market aftermarket wings. The problem is we don't know that we could get another set of wings that would be vastly better. Um, so we kind of pers persisted with them, knowing that the car had these wings when it came to us. But we've been round and round in circles and we've had to bite the bullet and say, the, 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 the long and short is we need to refabricate the back edge of these wings. They basically do not match the door. The, the distances between the swage lines on these wings are not correct. And no amount of fiddling around and adjusting and trying to average out errors is ever gonna make it look correct. So we've now decided to remanufacture the back edge of the wings with the correct distances between the swage lines. Uh, and then we've split the wing, moved the bottom part up there, Putting this, uh, and this obviously the part, of the part of the issue is the distance between the swage lines. The other part of the issue is that that shape at the back edge of the wing doesn't match the door. Um, it, it never did match the door on this car. There was always a variable gap up at the door, and it's, it's quite irritating to have that variable gap. And we couldn't really solve it. We, we, we put some weld on edges and fettled and filled with the gap um, to a point where we were kind of happy with it but not 100% happy. And having gone round the mill again with it all, we've decided actually this is no good. We're refabricating the back edge of the wing, 
give us a clean slate, we know it's going to fit the door, we know the swage lines all match up, everything lines up, the sill swage lines up, the door swages line up, everything's going to be right. It's a chunk of work to do, but it needs to be right, so it's going to be right, and that's what we're doing on that. So that's what Tom's working on at the moment. And marching on this way, we have Churchill. Stu's back from Orkney now. Uh, I'm back on with this this week. He has now be, he's been making, the, he started the modifications on the front, starting with the relatively simple ones, which were wheeling up the patch sections for the two original side marker lights uh, and let, getting those welded in, and then making up the patch sections for the uh, indicators uh, in the front of the wings there, which he's wheeled up and let in. Uh, and then he started work on the on replacing the lower front lower front panel around the grill aperture. I was just about to go off on a little side offshoot there. The little offshoot being, just to give some background to anybody coming into this video at this point, is we're significantly changing the front sheet metal work on this car. If, any, if you go back through the videos, you'll be able to see some pictures of what we're, the final look that we're aiming for, um, or the final sort of, uh, the, the final drawing that we're, uh, that we're aiming at. Um, but all of that means that we've got to modify all the sheet metal work in the front. Um, and there was also some bad repair work that had been done. And what, the car was actually very, very good originally, but there was one of the few areas that had got some grotty repairs was the standard area of the Mark II Jags do have those, which is under the front grille. So Stu's been fabricating this section uh, just this morning to, to go in round at the bottom of the front grille. He's had the grille in and out, just checking the fit on that. Uh, and then he's set to on making a profile section here to, uh, to, to get the correct profile for the end of the wing, which he's, which he's established from a drawing and from heights and various measurements. And then he's set to wheeling up the corner sections for the front wings. So I haven't actually seen that until now. This is literally the first time I've looked at it. I know he's been busy, but I've had my head in what I was doing. So I hadn't really looked and it's, it's looking really nice. He's doing a nice job of it. So uh, unsurprisingly, he's doing a nice job of it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he's gonna be marching on with this again next week. It's been, he's, he's done some really good progress this week. But bear in mind, we're, we're now, third, we're, we're talking now on Thursday. This is Thursday afternoon. And obviously we didn't, we, it was a short week. We didn't start until Tuesday this week. It was bank holiday on Monday so it's been a short it's been a very short week so far so yeah it's good making very good progress on this and uh, the, the, the shape on the front I know I say this every week but we're all we're looking forward to seeing the, the shape on the front of this develop this week again it's, it's it's exciting seeing seeing organic shapes develop in uh, in, in sheet metal never gets old it uh, I'm sure anybody who works in with that sort of uh, trade We'll, we'll, we'll say the same, that no matter how many hours you've done of that, if you're not doing repetition work, it never gets old. That, that, the enjoyment of making shapes in sheet metal, and frustrations as well, but, but, but that, that it, never, it never gets to be a boring process. So yeah, we're, we're, we're greatly enthused about that. And moving on again, is uh, Rich has been busy continuing with this, which has got relatively cut with the CV8 here, which has got relatively complicated, but is, is moving forward now. Uh, last week, you may remember, he had got the tools set up and um, made, made the return section for the uh, glass roof in fiberglass on, the, on this MDF tool that we'd had CNC machined. That went. That was successful. He's demolded that at the beginning of the week. Uh, that all looked good. That was, that was uh, all, a, all a good result. There was a couple of little nitpicks on it, but nothing, nothing drastic. No, no problems really. Um, and then, so he's trimmed that, trimmed the roof aperture, existing roof aperture on the car, then, so that we've got a, an edge-to-edge -edge joint between the new return piece of fiberglass and the original roof fiberglass. So we've got a, a butt joint all the way round. Uh, he's then got the tools bolted in and assembled into the roof uh, and then uh, vac bagged the lot, which has been quite a big nightmare, but anyway, he's vac, -bag vac bagged the lot and then fiberglass all the way around underneath so that we've got a lap joint in the fiberglass to attach the, the glass roof return into the original roof structure. It's quite a nightmare working on these cars because they're not the same, they're not symmetrical, nothing matches, it's just, just they're, a, they're a pickle to start with. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, challenging sort of start line to be working from. But he's got that all in, laminated, laid up now. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm done, I'm done now on that, the first layup. And, and uh, so the next, the next section is he's got to remove half of the tool once everything's fully, fully cured. Uh, he's got to remove half of the tool 
who, I'm going to be slightly out of my depth on commenting on this because I've forgotten the exact order of events. He's got to trim part of the tool slightly to get some more access and give him some more layup room. He's going to take the inner part of the tool away um, to give him the ability to lay up further past the join line. And he's going to do another layup on the inside. And then he's going to remove the outer part of the tool once that's fully cured and do another layup on the back of the roof to, to, to join the back of the roof in. And at that point, I think, we've pretty much got the roof um, aperture set in fiberglass ready for finishing. It will still need some filling and finishing and fettling, but that's basically the book, the structural part of the book for the glass roof insert in place then. We'll be able to then move on to lots of other fiberglass work that's got to be done. The, the fettling and finishing on the roof, and we've got various reinforcements to do. We've got to put reinforcements in for the inner wheel arches on the back. Got to do quite a few more geometric checks, and we've got still got quite a bit of finishing to do around the front and rear window apertures. Um, but we're waiting for the final glass for those, hazardous as that is, because it's quite expensive to use as a datum check. But we don't really want to leave the apertures sized to the old glass, because we have, although it should be similar, we don't know whether the new glass is going to be exactly the same, and it is being bonded in. So we want to make sure that the apertures are correct to the glass that's actually got to go in them. So we're waiting for the. Um, the glass to arrive from uh, Euro Glass, who are supplying that. So we're, we're, we're waiting for the glass to arrive for, for this, um, to be able to carry on with those areas. So steady progress, um, lots still to do, but move, moving forward, so all going well. And then finally, the body shop workload's been a bit here, here and there because we've had, there's been various jobs going on. You, Cal will have gone over the uh, Morris Minor flatting and polishing work that's been going on. Uh, so that's done now. Um, we now are into the final stages of prep on the Land Cruiser. And I think, we, yeah, we're just, uh, Steve is currently wet flatting the final epoxy on the Land Cruiser body tub. All of the panels are prepped and then the, this batch of panels around us now has had the underside rapture applied. The body shell has had the underside rapture applied. We saw that last week. These panels around us now have had their under, underside rapture applied. I think there's a small handful of other panels that need underside rapture. Uh, but then next week, we should be into final paint on the body tub, final paint on the outside of all of these parts that are surrounding us now. Uh, and final paint on the big pile of other panels that are also in the paint booth. It's quite complicated. If I'm looking a bit confused, it's because there's a number of finishes on various parts. Uh, so so the, 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 some of the rear panels on the car, we, a lot, all of these panels around us have body coloured um, Raptor truck bed liner coating on the inside, and then they'll have a, um, a, a, an A surface, you know, an external paint finish in body colour on the other side, on the currently masked side. The panels that are in the prep area at the moment on the panel uh, carrier are panels wh which I believe all of will have um, body coloured paint on the outside and the inside of all of those panels, not Raptor on those, but there are still a handful of panels in there which I think are still having Raptor on the inside as well, so it's quite complicated, but basically by the end of next week it all should be a sea of beige. <laughs> There'll be a lot of gloss beige and a lot of beige Raptor but by the end of next week it should, all being well, fingers crossed, no disasters, should all be in final paint. So thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed my ramblings, then like and subscribe. Hope I haven't rambled too much. That's been a bit of a walk around the workshop and see what we've been doing this week. So see you again soon.